Hey folks, welcome back to Game Geeks. I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Today's episode, we're doing something a little special. It is another Kickstarter back for Rippers Resurrected, a Savage Worlds setting. Now, for those of you who are eagle-eyed or just have a memory for this thing or care to go back in time and look, we've reviewed Rippers once before, way, way back many centuries ago. In fact, we did it back in episode 90, which is immediately after the infamous fourth edition review. That was the next one I did to sort of cleanse my palate after that review. And then once again in episode 157, where we did the Ripper's Companion and a few extra adventures as well. So for those of you who are new to this or don't know or remember what Rippers is or are interested in getting on board with the Kickstarter, I'm here to tell you a few things about the setting that make it different, make it interesting and fun and tell you why I think you should support it as a Kickstarter and to patronize the company when this comes out later. This is a game being produced by Pinnacle Entertainment, the makers of such fine games as Savage Worlds, Deadlands, East Texas University, all sorts of stuff we've reviewed, in fact, fairly recently. So, with Rippers, what you get is a, a Victorian era Monster Hunters game. Now, Dr. Weagle, yeah, there are a lot of these. Why should I buy into this one? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking me that. The reason you should buy into this one specifically is there brings a lot of new and interesting stuff to this era of gaming. It deeply, deeply embraces the era and the feel of that monster hunting genre. So if you've ever watched any of the classic Hammer Horror movies or any of the classic Frankenstein movies, that sort of, it's always raining in Eastern Europe and there's mountains and forests and things that are going bump in the night then that prey on people, well, there's where you are, but at the same time, what you also have is some of the high butt-kicking action that you get from Savage Worlds. So, what makes Rippers different than other Monster Hunters games, especially ones that are also set in the Victorian era? Well, here's what you get. In Rippers, the things that make it different are a bunch of new and interesting edges, the presence of Ripper Tech, more on that in just a second, factions, status, and finally, a reason score. Those are what make this game slightly different than others of its ilk is the presence of those five things. And we're going to go through those fairly quickly, but hopefully enough in depth that you'll be able to get a feel for what makes this fun. All right, let's go, let's start at the bottom here and go up because I did the easy ones at the end of the list. Reason is basically your sanity score. It's a sanity score. Nothing more exciting than that. It varies according to how much nastiness you've seen, how much fright you've, been, you've gotten in your life, etc. And it is calculated by half of your spirit plus two. Very similar to how we do parry and toughness, except you're using spirit this time. Now, just by seeing scary, nasty crap, your reason can go up and down a little bit. You might get the shakes, you might, eh, but you'll be okay overall. The way to really screw up your reason is by the implantation of Ripper Tech. More on that when we get up to there in just a second. So this isn't Call of Cthulhu where by opening a book and reading it you can go irrevocably mad, gibber, 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 but instead you might get the shakes, you might get a little but you're not gonna go irretrievably crazy as you would if you implanted a lot of Ripper Tech. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is your reason score is added to the fright table when you make a roll on it. So instead of low being good on the fright table now, they've flipped it. It's now 2d6 plus your reason score minus the fear factor on whatever the critter you're seeing is. So if you really have a lot of intestinal fortitude and you are willing to dive forward and face these things, then you're probably better off than just some mealy-mouthed person on the street trying to do this. 
you have a better chance of not doing poorly on the fright table. Status is quite frankly, simply where you are in the Victorian era setting. Status is a very important feature for that type of setting. One of the things I really like that Rippers does is it doesn't give you this exhaustive sociological analysis of the Victorian era like a lot of 1890s games do. I mean, what it assumes is, do you understand most of what you've seen in horror movies? Do you get what you see in Bram Stoker's Dracula, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, in, forgive me for saying this, but it was an awesome movie, Van Helsing, take it back a few decades, The Mummy, that sort of thing? Folks, that's how the status situation works. Your status is ranked according to where you are in the grand scheme of things. There's a money attachment to it, and there's also a favors factor that comes into it as well. One of the things that makes status work is there are mechanical benefits to it. For example, higher ranked characters are more able to intimidate their lessers. So if you are a rank or two or three higher than the person that you're trying to intimidate, then you have a bonus of one, two, or three to your intimidation score. On the flip side of that, the lower ranked characters have the same bonus for taunt. So it's easy for a street urchin to taunt a noble, and, but it's easier for the noble to intimidate the street urchin, if you get the idea there. There's also a favors factor that comes out of this, the number of favors that you can squeeze out of someone for an adventure. And also there is a scandal associated with it so that people of higher rank can indeed fall as, as their activities would entail. Now, Factions. This is one of the first spots where it gets a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to move down to this board right here so you can see it better. So what I recommend you do is while I walk down there, why don't you go back and look at episodes 90 and 157 so you can still see what we talked about there. I'm glad you're back. <sighs> Wasn't I thinner then? Anyway, factions. These are the organizations within the Grand Rippers organization itself that make it go. Obviously, whenever you have more than three or four people involved, politics starts to play a role. It's no different in a grand secret organization whose entire purpose in life is to hunt monsters. The factions as presented in the kickstart are Masked Crusaders, Old Worlders, Slayers, the Order of St. George, Witch Hunters, and Frasers. Fighters. Each one of these specializes in a specific monster type or a specific environment in which to do your hunting. The Masked Crusaders are your shadows, they are your masked swordsmen who run around usually inside of a city and fight the forces of evil inside that city and protect the normal people. They wear masks so their identity is not commonly known. Old Worlders stalk the old forests and mountains of Europe and hunt werewolves. Slayers are vampire hunters. The Order of St. George is your highly religious order, ostensibly Catholic, but not, stri but not strictly bound by that denomination. They have mystic artifacts, which they get to help fight the darkness. These seem to focus on undead and demonic types. Witch hunters, mortals who dabble in forces they don't understand. And finally, Frasier's fighters, who are sort of your stout, square-jawed, British, Middle Eastern warrior types of that era. Now, with each of these, I'm going to kind of skip up to edges a little bit, come some edges that specifically apply to each one of these lodges. For example, in Frasier's Fighters, you have the edges gone native, which means that you are now have gone, you've lived in that area long enough that you're now considered one of them, and therefore you don't have the outsider hindrance while you're there. They also have Tomb Hunter, which allows you to do at, better, be better at acrobatic tricks and better at fighting in the tight con confines of a tomb, crypt, or any other underground setting. 
Also, there is, for the old worlders, there's the wolf and Jaeger, or the wolf hunters, where you are better at fighting and defending yourselves from, and you know a little bit more about your prey. So there are edges to go with each one of these. Does your ripper have to be part of one of these factions? No, but there are certain advantages that come with it. Now, a slight corollary to factions is one I should have put over there on the list, but I didn't. A slight corollary to factions are lodges. These lodges are permanent structures at various points across the world where your organization holds sway. Now, you can either join an existing lodge or create your own. They are ranked going upwards. And the lodge value, what you get with your lodges, is there is a size, there is the amount of stuff you can have there from an armory to a lab for more Ripper tech. Notice how I keep coming back to Ripper tech. It's one of the main things that make this game unique. To libraries, etc. These lodges can also be aligned with one faction or another, and politics can certainly hold sway there as well. So this is a, a slightly more meta aspect or a level up on the game that you wouldn't normally see. In fact, there was a very interesting, and I apologize, I cannot remember the name of it, but it was for the showdown rules many, many years ago that was the lodges, using the lodges for skirmish battles against werewolf-type monsters or other monsters that you might be fighting. All right, moving on to the final board here, Ripper Tech. This was one of the more controversial pieces of the original game. The idea behind Ripper Tech is simply this. Your organization has figured out the way to literally rip pieces out of the monsters. To rip chunks out of the monsters and then surgically implant them into your hunters to make them better at killing other monsters. So it's sort of a really gruesome, icky, cyberware sort of idea. Where, do you want werewolf claws? No problem! You just capture a werewolf alive, tie it down, vivisect it, take out its claws and attach them to your hands. It's really icky if you think about it. So with each of these, though, there come problems. The surgery is fraught with, with potential dangers, considering, well, this is Victorian era. Their surgical knowledge wasn't exactly great. And the fact that each piece of Ripper tech you add, the bigger it is, remember, this is modeled off cyberware, the bigger or more impressive it is, the more on the hit on your reason you will take. So it is able to go permanently bat crap crazy and gain a ripping psychosis once you've implanted enough of these pieces of the monster into yourself. One of the main changes from previ the previous edition of the game is in that game, in the plot point campaign, it was made very clear that rippers who attach pieces of monsters to themselves, people who use ripper tech, um, are damning themselves to hell for eternity, and then your souls in hell get pieces ripped out of them and placed into monsters, making them tougher to fight on Earth. It's kind of a big fuck you, if you think about it, because this stuff that you're using to make your fight better is ultimately causing the destruction of the world. In the new era of the game, in this new version of the game, that doesn't seem to be present anymore. Either they found better methods of making it work, or they found ways of making it less spiritually damaging, or they've just covered it up because they still need to fight the bad guys. None of the, none of the material that I read seemed to make that very clear one way or another, which I respect because that leaves it up to the GM, but at the same time, it'd be nice to know kind of what idea they had in the first place. I would say, if I were running it, it's when you descend into ripping psychosis that these, your soul becomes a problem to you. Now, the ripper tech varies from anywhere from um, eyes that let you see in the dark, mesmeric eyes from a vampire, vampire fangs, werewolf claws, etc. There's less permanent versions of these that you can do, which are elixirs or drafts, such that you could have a potion that does any one of those but makes you sick afterwards. It's not permanent, but it doesn't cost you any permanent reason to use. It's also less expensive and less dangerous. 
Now, in terms of the plot point campaign, one comes with every one of these, it assumes that you are at least vaguely aware of the, the first plot point campaign that was presented, which involved the Rippers getting involved in this massive fight against the Cabal, which was led by Jack the Ripper, Dracula, Frankenstein, and Dr. Prometheus, which is this setting's version of Dr. Moreau. Although I'm forced to wonder if, I don't know where the public domain situation of Dr. Moreau is, but it's called Dr. Prometheus here, so all is fine. They're all, that was, you were fighting them with some Atlantean bad guys, they're all dead. That was the end of your last campaign. Either you won or the world descended into chaos and blood. So, now it is an entirely new adventure that picks up. I won't tell you a lot about it in case your GM wants to run it for you. But it reads very well, it holds up very much like your excellent plot point campaigns you've come to expect with these prescribed adventures that occur, but room for your own to be stuffed in there as well. In terms of a Kickstarter campaign, it's modeled very similarly to the ones that have got, come before for Pinnacle Entertainment, and it holds up very nicely. At various levels, you can buy into the PDFs, the soft cover, or the hard cover versions of each of these books. They're also producing maps, they're producing dice, custom bennies, etc. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Rippers. Truly, I have. I've never really had an opportunity to run it, but I think that this new version of it opens up a world of possibilities and brings to light a game that may have gotten by a lot of more recent Savage Worlds fans that weren't aware of before. It's not just another Victorian era game with magic and monsters. This has an additional level of complexity, darkness, and bite to it that you wouldn't necessarily see in something like Gaslight Cthulhu or Ghosts of Albion. If you're interested at the time of this filming, which is 1222, p.m. on October 13th, I think? Yeah, October 13th, 2015, Central Time in Wisconsin. Then if you're, if you, at this time it has succeeded in its funding well above where it was and they're in the process of kicking it into high gear to give you more material and more extras for the level of support that you buy in and that they have in total. I highly recommend this game. It's a lot of fun. Go take a look at it. For Game Geeks, I'm Kurt Weigel. Good day and good gaming.